signori, buonasera. E grazie eh, di essere qui. Siamo a una giornata un po' strana, dato i problemi eh, di trasporto, però non è tanto la quantità ma la qualità che conta, insomma, less is more, come si dice. E, e sono davvero lieto di presentarvi il conferenziere di stasera che ci parlerà di una tematica molto importante e molto importante in particolare anche eh, per la nostra collezione, per il luogo da cui la nostra collezione eh, procede. Abbandono l'italiano per introdurlo in una, nella, mia, nella mia sorta di inglese, ma di modo che almeno vi possa capire. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Daniel Soliman, who is uh, a friend and colleague, and, uh, and it's a great joy to have him here and to have uh, uh, Professor De Marais here, who uh, have been here for a few days, uh, looking around our collection, giving advice, um, and uh, being inspired by the wonderful collection that we have here, we have here in Turing. Uh, it's also um, pleasure to hear from Daniel the first results of his ongoing research on mark signs in uh, uh, well, different objects, especially objects coming from uh, Dura Medina and from the necropolis, which as you know our uh, museum is so rich of, so, and I think there might be many points of interest for us who can, that can help also to understand better the signs we have here. I know that uh, Daniel has been looking at Ostraka this afternoon, so maybe has come up with some new ideas, but we are very willing to, to hear you and to, to hear what you have to tell us. And thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. talking today uh, about, uh, as Dr. Greco has mentioned, uh, a research project in, in, at the University of Leiden. It's called um, Symbolizing Identity, uh, Identity Marks and the Relation to Writing in uh, New Kingdom Egypt. So this is a research project um, supervised by Dr. Ben Harik at Leiden University and uh, my colleague here for the Muslims and myself are uh, the PhD students in this project. Um, We'll, we will be looking at um, the Theban Acropolis. Yes. Um, the Theban Acropolis, so the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, and also the settlement of uh, the place that we call Dino Medina nowadays. Uh, the place that was inhabited in the 18th, 19th, and 20th dynasty by the, the people that built uh, the royal tombs, that constructed and decorated the royal tombs in the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of Queens. Now, this is a site, of course, a marvelous site, and we know so very much about it and about the people that live there, about the community that live there. Um, that is um, um, due to the, to the fact that we have so much material from this site and from the Valley of the Kings itself. Um, there are, of course, uh, various papyri, uh, many of them kept here in Turin, uh, uh, that document life and work uh, and events at, in this community. Uh, one of the famous papyri of course, the Turin Strike Papyrus, that is particularly <laughs> interesting today. Um, uh, but there are also numerous ostraca that come from this site, uh, inscribed with uh, hieratic script, most of them, and there are uh, so many documentary texts. Again, they refer to, uh, they mention, they document the work on the tomb, they list the, the, the names of the workmen that are, that are working on the tombs, uh, absence and presence of the workmen at the work site, um, they mention the distribution of goods and food, um, uh, different types of subjects. Also, there are private letters, um, there are accounts, uh, there are, uh, name it, it's there. Also, um, <coughs> a lot of literary texts come from the Medina and have been, have been found at different sites. This is a beautiful example uh, of, a, of an, uh, an instruction text, but there are also you know, pieces of poetry. Um, now, because of all of this information, 
we get a clear view of, of, of what's, what life was like in, in Germany and, and how this community lived. And in some cases, thanks to all of these documentary texts, but also because of all the information that we gain from, from tombs and from stila and from, from statuary that's inscribed with names and titles, it is oftentimes possible to really reconstruct the ge geological ties of particular families. Um, so, all in all, we, have a, we are very lucky with the with It's one of the best uh, documented villages of antiquities, in fact. Um, having said that, this is all true for the 19th and the 20th dynasty. The situation in the 18th dynasty is a bit different. Um, we have, in fact, hardly any documentary texts from this period. There's perhaps a, a handful. Um, there are much, well, considerably less uh, tombs from this period that are uh, intact, that are, that are uh, well enough preserved to, to uh, arrive at any conclusions. Um, and we, we in fact know very few of these people. We, we hardly know any names. There are, of course, there are some people, but we cannot really do something like this, reconstruct these family ties for the 18th dynasty. So there's still a lot of mystery concerning this period. Um, there is, of course, one exception. Uh, there are a few, but there is one that is really exceptional. There is a tomb uh, to the northwest of the settlement discovered by Schiaparelli. And it's an individual, it belongs to an individual that you all know very well. It's, of course, Ha, the uh, chief uh, of the workmen. Uh, who lived during the 18th dynasty and his tomb was found intact and uh, is really a uh, treasure full of objects and, and, and uh, gives us really an insight into life during the 18th dynasty. Um, we know from the inscriptions from the tomb of Ha that he was uh, an overseer of the work, also from, from one of his stila, uh, Cartier in Turin. Uh, that Ha was overseer of work uh, of the Great Place. Now, the Great Place must have been a um, designation for uh, the greater Theban necropolis of the Eighth Dynasty. <coughs> so, the, the, the Valley of the Kings, and perhaps also the Valley of the Queens. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, he was uh, not just any person, he was the, the chief of, of workmen. Um, now, the objects from his tomb, you know much better than I do. You've seen it plenty of times, and it contains all these marvelous artifacts, uh, pieces of furniture, and, and his linen, um, well preserved pieces of pottery, and his, his scribal sets. And there are, of course, uh, his architectural instruments, um, among which are his, his cubit rods, so his measuring instruments, uh, one of which is wrapped in gold, gold foil, and it has been pointed out that um, these, 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 these objects, they, they, they tell something about the status of, of Ha. Um, this one, for example, is inscribed with the name uh, of, of, the, of King Amnon II, King of the 18th Dynasty. And there is this piece uh, inscribed with uh, the name of Amnon III. So, Ha was not just any person, he uh, received these gifts from, from the king, from, from several kings. And uh, so an inscription of Amnon III, but also his own uh, name and title has been inscribed in ink on this piece. Now, if we look at some of the other objects from his tomb, um, if we start with pottery, with the ceramic vessels, we see on several of them um, a very odd mark, a sign, a sign that we do not know from hieroglyphic or from hieratic. In fact, I cannot tell you what it represents exactly, what it, what it, what it, what it is, but it's there, incised in the pottery, um, on, on many, many of them. And if we look a little further, there are some of his bronze objects that are worked with this, the very same side, this, this odd, yeah, I don't know what it is. Uh, there is a city line with this sign, there is a standard for, 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 for a vessel, um, same sign, also found uh, in his linen, several pieces of them, 
they are, uh, as in this case, embroidered into the linen. Um, interestingly, some of his linen are inscribed in ink, the red ink, with his name um, in, uh, in, in hieroglyphic. And the same ink is used also to add his mark on several uh, pieces of, of his linen. Um, now, what can we assert about this sign? What does it mean? Um, well, you can look at these vessels and, and, and then perhaps say, well, maybe this mark uh, designates the, the content of the vessel, or maybe it uh, refers to the producer of the vessel, but that wouldn't make so much sense because we find the same mark also on pieces of linen, so it cannot refer to the content of the vessel. And, the producer of, 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 of linen is not the same producer who makes uh, ceramic vessels and, uh, and, and, and bronze uh, objects. So, what do these objects have in common? It's their owner. It's Ha himself. So, I think that this sign represents Ha, he is in his identity, in the very same way that the hieroglyphic inscriptions do. Now, we continue with some other objects from his tomb. Um, Again, we find really odd signs uh, in the, the, the vessel above here. There is a fork-shaped sign, not known from hieroglyphic. Then there is a drill from his tomb, incised with a cross. Uh, there are pieces of, of other pottery which have a star. And there are other objects. For on, the, on the left you see a mirror-shaped sign, I think, and then there is a piece of pottery incised with a head of a, of a cross. Now, um, these other signs in the Tupac occur maybe once or twice, whereas the, the mark that I, that I propose is the mark of Ra himself, are, are uh, frequently attested. So who are these other people? Well, uh, let us expand our view and look at some of the other tombs uh, at during the 18th dynasty. Again, there are several pieces of pottery uh, that are found uh, mostly by Guillermo. Uh, well, they're also found by Schiaparelli, actually. I've seen them today and yesterday. <laughs> they're here in the collection. Uh, they have been found at uh, 18th dynasty uh, tombs. And some of them, indeed, represent signs that we know from hieroglyphic, but many others do not. Um, and they're always on the, they're always isolated on a piece of pottery. So a single sign on a single piece of pottery, or also on some of, some of the objects from these tombs. But unfortunately, we know very little about these tombs, as, as we have seen. Uh, these tombs are, are often very disturbed. Um, if they are in, in, in a good shape, um, they hardly contain any inscriptions uh, or any textual material, so we do not know the owners of these tombs. Um, there's one exception here on the left, a person who is called Hekka Nefer, uh, written on the same vessel that, that carries one of his sons. But other than that, we know very little about these tombs. Um, then, we go to the Fetic of Kings, uh, we find again pieces of pottery near some of the 18th dynasty royal tombs. This is a, 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 in the picture above you see some of the temporary constructions that have been built um, close to the tomb of Amenhotep III. They were built for the workmen, they were small huts that were used by the workmen when they were working on this tomb. And now near these huts, pieces of pottery again have been found with some of these odd signs, some of these marks. Um, and if you look to the examples on, on the left and in the middle, we find the same star and the same four-shaped sign that we have seen in the tomb of Ha. So, we have these signs in the tomb of Ha, in the tombs of the Yankee dynasty at the Romandina, and close to uh, the royal tombs dated to the Yankee dynasty in the Benedict Kings. The conclusion can only be that we are here dealing with uh, identity marks of the workmen of the 18th dynasty. Now, there is even more. Um, not only do we find these signs of pottery and objects, they are also inscribed in a series of ostraca uh, coming from the village of Dermedino, 
but also from the Flanagan Decades. And um, this is an example published by Brière. Uh, it's a complete piece. And I think this is a list of all the workmen that are working at one particular time <coughs> with all their marks. And we see some of them that we recognize from the tomb of, of Ha. Uh, there's the mirror, there's the star, uh, the cross, and this forge inside. There are also pieces um, of Ostroka uh, that show the sign of Ha. I have, I have not included them in my presentation, but some of them exist. Uh, some of them among other workmen, and some by himself. So, uh, finally, we have some information about this 18th dynasty and about the workmen and uh, the administration of their work. It's very mysterious because, you know, we have only these marks, uh, but there is something. So, that's a very interesting phenomenon, but it's certainly not something that is completely unique to Germany. Uh, if you look at uh, other places in Egypt and other times in the Egyptian history, uh, you see that marks and signs have been used to refer to, well, uh, crews of workmen, sometimes individual workmen, individual workmen as well. Um, you find these signs mostly, or we find them, they are tested mostly at uh, construction sites and at quarries stone quarries. So, uh, an example of this is, is the, the quarry of uh, Jebel Sicilia, used in the New Kingdom, um, <coughs> among other periods. Um, but there are also examples from uh, the quarries uh, used uh, for the, the city of Omar, and they, they have been attested at, uh, at, at other, other places. So, in Dil Medina, what we have is, is unique in the way, in the sense that they uh, are very elaborate with this, this, this usage of marks and uh, the way they, they uh, construct uh, ostraca, use, use, use these marks to, to, to write ostraca, but the phenomenon itself is not unique. Um, and it's not even unique to, to Egypt. Uh, they have been tested in other places in the world, and perhaps an uh, example close uh, to our home is, uh, are the, uh, the Mason's marks from medieval Europe. Um, they are tested in, in several buildings, often in churches, and represent uh, the masons, the people that cut the stones that were used in the building of such constructions. And as in the Medina, some of these signs are derived from, from script, from, from, the, from the alphabet, but many others are not. They are rather geometrical shapes. Um, well, I can show you some examples from this view. Uh, these are from the south of Italy, I believe, and you can see the influence of the script uh, in, uh, in the, the, the example of love, but others, well, yeah, not really. Um, this, these are two examples from, uh, uh, from Venice, really used uh, on the stone blocks by these mason smarts. Uh, but interestingly, they are also sometimes used in, uh, in script. Uh, for example, in, in contracts that are crafted by a professional scribe. We're talking about medieval times, so many people are illiterate, but you have, of course, professional scribes. And when they need to uh, craft up uh, a contract, the professional scribe will write down the names of these persons, and the masons then sort of sign these documents by placing their uh, own personal mark next to your name. Now, this is in a way comparable to what we see in the Um And that's what this, this topic is about, about, uh, about the Medina and the way these marks are used. Um, so far I've been talking about the 18th dynasty, but we find identity marks in the community of Dermedina also in the 19th and the 20th dynasty. And they give us uh, a unique insight in, in, in Way uh, these people at the Medina dealt with the influence of script because we tend to think of the Medina as this place where everyone is writing and we have all of these texts and all of these papyri. Um, certainly, people were, 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 more, were more literate uh, at the Medina than at other sites, I, I believe. Um, but it doesn't say that everyone is writing. Um, and I think what we have here with these, these 
these identity marks is, is a way for people who are not fully literate or perhaps illiterate uh, to be able to, uh, to, to mark their own property, uh, to, to mark space, to, uh, uh, to construct or to, to document things. Um, and, and so what I would like to do today is, is to give you an overview of what uh, these marks do on East Austria and, and um, how the system of using identity marks on Ostrica sort of develops over time. Uh, now, uh, this is an example, as you, as you will recognize by now, of the 1890s, it's the four shaped sign, um, found uh, at the Valley of the Kings, and uh, it consists uh, only of well, one identity mark and then a series of strokes. So, on the one hand, we're really happy to have this piece because finally we have some evidence of well, perhaps documentation. On the other hand, it's extremely difficult to interpret because we have nothing else. We have no written uh, text that, that explains what's, what is happening here. Obviously, someone is counting something, but what exactly? You don't know. It could be the days that someone has worked, it could be the, the, the well, quantities of stone that someone has cut out, but it could be something totally different. Um, here's a piece that is similar to the other Ostrogon that we just saw, uh, probably originally re represented the entire crew of workmen. Uh, again, this is a piece from the 18th dynasty. And you can see that in this instance, uh, the marks are written in horizontal lines. And you will have noticed that next or uh, underneath or above these marks, uh, dots have been added. Again, something is, is being counted. And uh, as you can see here in this piece, red ink has been used to, to check some of these uh, dots. They have been written over the black dots. So someone has revised this postural problem, obviously. What exactly is happening here? It's probably work-related, you think, because it deals with the entire crew. Uh, it could also have something to do with the distribution of food, of, of, of commodities. Um, but that's very difficult to, to explain. Well, in our last example we saw a, uh, a layout in horizontal lines, but there are also very interesting pieces that, uh, well, the example of offer, uh, for instance, <coughs> has marks that follow the outline of the Ostrogon. So, uh, the first row was written from right to left, and then the scribe got to the corner of the ostracon and turned around and then in the second line he's writing from left to right. And that's something that uh, a professional scribe will probably never do. Someone who is trained in hermetic script will not uh, construct documents like that. This is probably the work of someone who is not uh, trained formally in, in hermetic. Um, the, the piece below is, uh, is written in two lines, but because uh, the sequence of marks is known from other pieces, it's, for example, uh, quite akin to the piece above, we know that, we, uh, that this piece was also written uh, first from right to left in the upper row, and then at the end of the line, the scribe continued down to the second row and uh, started at the left side continue to the right side. We know this because we know the sequence of the marks. Uh, that's something also particular for the 18th dynasty uh, Ostrogoth with the marks. Um, now, I've been focusing a little bit on uh, illiteracy and literacy at, uh, at the Medina. Now, I, I certainly do not mean to say that um, everybody in the 18th dynasty the Medina community was illiterate, that's, that's probably not the case, and uh, we know that there were scribes there, we have some, some of their titles, well, not many, but some of them, and of course we know that texts were added to the royal tombs in the 18th dynasty. Um, but if you look at this piece, uh, the lower line of marks is inscribed with rather big, sloppy and thick signs. And if you compare it to the, to the row of, of marks above it, I think we have a different scribe. So this is a piece 
um, probably produced by two different people. And the scribe on the first line, if you look at some of the, uh, the bird signs, right, the, the duck, for example, and, and the, the owl, you, you see that this is someone who, who has knowledge of, 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 of hieratic script or hieroglyphic script. It's, it's a well-trained hand. So there are certainly in this community people uh, who have a much better knowledge of, of script also producing these sites and, 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 and uh, recording whatever it is that they are recording in this way. Um, what you also might have noticed by now is that there is quite some variance in the shapes of, uh, of these marks. Um, and again, we can really compare it when we have similar sequences or, or exactly the same sequences or on different pieces, then we can compare the way these signs were, were made. Now, <clears throat> we find some interesting things. Um, the same sign on one ostracon can be found on another ostracon in the exact same position according to the sequence, but in a different way. Sometimes it's inverted and sometimes it's mirrored. And sometimes it's a very elaborate sign or, or very uh, abbreviated sign. Um, I can show you <coughs> some examples. There is there's quite uh, 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 an extent to which these signs can vary. Um, now this may have to do something with uh, different scribes, but I also think that it has something to do with um, the way these people uh, yeah, are trained in, in, in script or not. Um, the, the, the turning around and the, the mirroring of signs is, is something that you, you find among uh, people who are, who are uh, well, semi-literate, small, small children who are starting to learn how to, to write, do the same thing. They invert and mirror their, their images, their, um, their letters. Well, uh, we have some of these, these Ostroka with um, the, the very same sequence of marks, or almost the same sequence of marks. This in itself is interesting because it shows us um, that these people were producing such ostraca with marks as a habit. They, they did it more often and they had a fixed sequence of signs in, uh, in their head. So uh, it also reminds us of uh, uh, some of the name lists that we know from the 19th and the 20th dynasty written. In uh, and in such name lists, uh, the workmen are often given in a particular order. Um, these are often hierarchical orders, right? So the, uh, the most influential and the most experienced workmen are listed at the beginning of the list, and the younger, uh, less experienced uh, workmen are found towards the bottom uh, of such lists. Now, because we have fixed sequences here in the 18th dynasty, uh, of Marx, something similar could be happening here too. We don't know that, we can't prove it, but it's something that is worth considering. There is perhaps already a hierarchical structure um, that is also um, suggested by the fact that on one of these Ostraka, where we have the Mark of Khan, who was the overseer of the work uh, in the Great Place, is listed in the first position in one of the sequences of Marx. So that could be an indication that the, the foreman is listed at the beginning, as he is in the 19th and 20th dynasty. So that's something that is quite similar. Um, now, because of our knowledge of these marks uh, uh, in the 18th dynasty uh, that we that we get from from the Ostraka, uh, we can start to interpret some of the archaeological evidence. Um, as I've told you. These marks are found on, on pieces of pottery and objects that we find in, in tombs at Termodina. And they have also been found in a group of burials to the east of the settlement. And this place has been called the, the Eastern Cemetery. Now, there has been some, some discussion about this uh, Eastern Cemetery. Um, again, these tombs are, are, are hard to interpret. There is very little textual information from these tombs. In some of these tombs you find textual information, but hardly any titles. So, well, who are these persons? Do they belong to, to, to the Dermodina workmen, or do they come from somewhere else? Now, 
We can still not prove who these people are, but what is clear right now is that these identity marks have also been attested in these tombs. They are found on objects and on pottery, and we can relate them to the workmen because we have them in the Western Cemetery, we have them in the Pedic the Kings, and we have them even in the Tomb of Khan. So, um, what uh, uh, do these marks do in these tombs if they, if they do not belong to, uh, to the European <coughs> workmen? Well, you know. It could be that they were neighbors or something, but I think that the suggestion that these tombs of the, of the Eastern Cemetery belong to the workmen of, of the Medina is more plausible now that we have their marks in these tombs. Also, um, look at the lower uh, entry in this table. This is a tomb uh, described by Van Krier as uh, the tomb of a child. Now, in this tomb, six of the same uh, uh, Workmen's marks have been attested belonging to a workman. Um, so, who, are, who was the person that provided these, 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 these funerary gifts in that tomb? Probably so, uh, someone from the child's family. So, I think that we are dealing, at least in some of these tombs, with workmen of the 18th dynasty. Let's move on to the Renaissance period, so the 19th and the 20th dynasty. Um, from this period, we find uh, stones or, or pieces of, of pottery inscribed with a single mark, such as in, uh, such as just these as shown here, and uh, they've been called name stones. Um, there are, in fact, also pieces of pottery written inscribed with names, and they were probably put you know, in a certain space or next to uh, certain uh, objects to, to indicate who the owner was of, of, of that space or those objects. Something similar might be happening here with these marks. Uh, they can be placed anywhere and, and the community would understand who these objects or this space belong to. That's one way in which uh, uh, Ostraka are used uh, in the uh, 19th and 20th dynasty. Um, but for the first time, we also see the identity marks appearing in the graffiti in the Thiba Mountains. Uh, well, with perhaps one or two exceptions, most of the graffiti in the Thiba Mountains uh, left by the workmen uh, date to the 19th and 20th dynasty. There is, there is no clear example for the 18th dynasty, with some uh, exceptions. Uh, so we find these workmen's marks written next to uh, hieratic uh, inscriptions, and sometimes this can lead to an identification of um, uh, the identity mark, the, the person behind this mark, right? So a name is sometimes written, and then we find a mark next to it, but that, is, that doesn't happen too often. But there are some cases. There are also instances of really just groups of workmen's mark marks uh, written together uh, in the same way that they are found in the Um Again, as in the 18th dynasty, we find identity marks on, uh, on, on objects and on pottery found in tombs. And I think that these, these uh, identity marks on, on pottery are used in the same way that some of these uh, vessels are inscribed with names. Here are some examples from the 18th and the 19th dynasty. They are inscribed with the owner of the tomb. And in the same way, these marks are sometimes added to the pottery library. Now, um, if we go to the tomb of Nefer Abed, TT5, uh, Nefer Abed, uh, uh, a workman of the 19th dynasty, we are in a very lucky position because on fragments of his pottery, we find uh, of his name written out in hieroglyphs and next to it his identity mark. This is one of the few cases where we find both together and we can really identify uh, the, the, the person behind the mark. So in this case, the case of Nebra Abed, we have the flagellum that is used um, for, his, uh, for his, uh, his, as his identity mark. Then we go to another tomb of the 19th dynasty, the tomb of Amun and Wea. <coughs> and we find the plethora of, 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 of marks have been found in his tomb. Um, some of them are fragmentary, so we can't really uh, identify them. But there, there are many of them. 
Um, most of them occur only once or twice, but there is one mark that is a testimony <coughs> four times. It's the, the sign that you see here on the, on the left. And it's probable that this sign refers to Amenomia himself, whereas these other signs are um, signs of, of people that gave a vessel to him as a funerary gift. Okay, so we have for the 19th dynasty two uh, plausible identifications. Now, let's look at some of the hieratic written documentary texts. Um, this is a very famous piece in the British Museum. It's uh, a list of uh, workmen uh, from the reign of Ramesses II. And uh, it lists whether these people were absent or present at, at the work site and why they were absent. So, uh, very interesting. Now, as I mentioned, these workmen are listed often in a hierarchical position, like a fixed position. Um, and uh, when we turn to the reverse of this piece, we see that in the first position, um, well, let me first explain, we are dealing here uh, on the reverse with the right side of the crew. And you might know that the Dilmatina uh, crew of workmen was um, divided into two crews, and the Egyptian word is the right side and the left side. Right? Um, we turn to the reverse of this obstacle, and we have get a list of the, uh, the right side of the, 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 the workmen. Now, in position one, uh, Mr. Guimekri is, is mentioned. Then we go to Amenomia, Nirkhalo, and Neverat. Now, two of these people we, uh, we have identified and identified their mark. Uh, of course, just a reminder, these marks are not present in the Arabic Osirka, but just to, to show that two of these people we, we know their marks. Um, if we then turn to this piece, <coughs> Uh, an Ostrogon that was found in the Valley of the Kings uh, by the mission of the Lazai Press, not far from uh, the tomb of Ramesses II. We see some marks in the first line. Well, it's not very clear. Um, so, this mark here is damaged. You cannot really see what, what is going on there. Then we can turn to the second sign. It is the sign, it's damaged, but you can recognize it. It's the sign of Owen and Weir. Then there is a third sign, and in the fourth position, we find this sign that we have described to never have. So, in the same relative position as we have seen on the heretic piece. Now, uh, ideally, we can then also identify the third person. Um, we, know, we know from uh, the uh, Ostrogon and the British Museum, <coughs> in the third position we have Ini Hechao. And the sign that we have here is actually an Ini sign. So, that is an indication that um, Inir Fowl is mentioned here with his workman's mark at the Indy side. Um, that is possible. It's possible to identify Inni, uh, the identity mark Inni, with the workman Inir Fowl. Because when we go to a tomb from the 20th dynasty, <coughs> uh, the tomb of Inir Fowl II, so the grandson of the Inir Fowl who we were just talking about, we also find pottery uh, with workman's marks on them. Again, quite a variety, but there is one mark that occurs most frequently, and it's the E sign. Uh, so, we have a clear indication, well, it's, it's an indication, it's not a proof, but it's an indication that the E cow is represented um, by the E sign, which would make sense, it's not so strange. That would mean that Ini Erhau II, the grandson of Ini Erhau I, uh, had the same sign as his grandfather did. And we can prove that this is true because uh, from the 20th dynasty we have more information. We will come to the 20th dynasty a little bit later, but we have much more information. And we know that the son of Ini Erhau II, uh, who was called Kenna, uh, was uh, using the Ini sign as his identity mark. This means that we have a generation in which a, a family a family line in which through the generations one single identity mark is passed on, uh, which is very interesting to, to, to note, of course. So coming back to this piece, we have uh, uh, probably a list of workmen uh, in the same way that we have seen them in the 18th dynasty, more or less. It's 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 rows of identity marks. 
Now, we can identify three of them through the British Museum of Ostrakhan, but unfortunately, here the comparison stops. Uh, first of all, the British Museum piece mentions much more workmen, this is not probably an entire list of all the workmen. And I also have the impression that they not only mention workmen at the right side, but also on the left side. But we can make some guesses. For example, here you see a group uh, that we can read. It's uh, the, the nature sign. And well, you need some imagination, but you can, you can read this as head. And we know from the 20th dynasty, that workmen, uh, sorry, from the 9th dynasty, from the time of Ramses II, workmen called Ta Hen Nature. So it's very probable that we are dealing here with Ta Hen Nature. Here you find uh, a sign that is derived from hieratic, and we can read it. It's the Sesh sign, obviously. So could it be that this is the scribe of the tomb, Ramses Ostrogon? That's possible. We, we have evidence for the 20th dynasty that the scribe of the tomb is indeed represented by the, the scribe was set by the, the sign of Sesh. So, what we have here in the 19th dynasty are much, uh, many more uh, of signs that are derived from uh, hieratic or hieroglyphic script, much more than in the 18th dynasty. And uh, we also see that some of these signs have a clear relation to the name of this, this workman. For the Indian dynasty, that is very difficult to, to determine because you hardly know any of their names and you can make very few identifications. But for the 19th dynasty, this is uh, uh, very much the case. On the other hand, we need to be cautious uh, because we just saw that signs can be inherited, they can be passed on uh, through the generations. So, Kenna, at some point in time, was also referred to by the Indian dynasty. So, you cannot always identify. Uh, work and simply by reading the market. It doesn't work that way. Um, what we also find for the first time in the 19th dynasty is uh, Ostrogoth on which the identity marks are combined with uh, numerals, hieratic numerals. We did not have that in the 18th dynasty yet. And I give you here uh, well, a schematic way of uh, one of the Ostrogoth that is not published, um, Captain Cairo. Um, on the, the, the left side, uh, some workmen that we have identified by now. So this is Bukentula, this is Wenefer, this is Anwe, this is a workman who we do not know. Uh, and here, uh, the identity mark of someone called Ma, uh, Ma, Mi, Rachu. Um, again, we can, we can read this more or less. This is the Ma side, and the stroke over here must represent the I. Um, they are written next to a vessel, uh, which is, I think, not a workman's mark, but really a depiction of a vessel. And we have other apostrophe from the 19th dynasty where uh, we find a combination of workman's marks together with depictions of objects and commodities. So we are probably dealing there on such ostraca with either the distribution of goods or um, the deliveries of goods. Um, we will come back to this point later, but um, the Dermadino workmen received their, their commodities, their, their, their food and their, their drinks uh, from outside. And, and these, these deliveries are well recorded in Iran. It could be that we have something similar going on here in the 19th dynasty. Um, so we have as a new development in the 19th dynasty the addition of signs for commodities and the use of hieratic numerals. Now let's turn to the 20th dynasty. Um, here we have a beautiful piece that I saw today, uh, just a couple of hours ago. It's a beautiful piece kept in the Turin Museum. Um, very beautifully done. And uh, again, if you look at some of these marks, um, they are almost entire names. Here, for example, a nap sign and a nefer sign. Together, we can read this as nap nefer, which is a very common name in the Um Here, also, a head up sign and a nefer sign. Uh, together, nefer hotel, also a very, very famous name in the Dunedina. But again, we need to be cautious. Uh, in fact, we know uh, who this word is at this point in time. Uh, it's Veshun Petr, uh, 
uh, who is related to someone called Neferhotep. So probably this mark is also passed on through the generations. But, well, I think the majority of the signs on this ostracon are really signs that we know from straight. Uh, with a few exceptions, but now here in the 20th dynasty, quite late already in the 20th dynasty, we find that uh, many signs are really just derived from script. And, and sometimes form entire word groups. Here, for example, is a word that's marked. I hope you can read it. It's uh, the E and men together, you can read Imen uh, for a word that we had the, uh, the element Imen in his name, probably. Um, and this must be also one of these lists of word uh, in the same way that you find such lists in heretic, in heretic documentation. Also, if you look at the way this is produced, again, this is a beautiful hand. I think this is someone who is, who is, who is well acquainted with script. And if you look at the very hieratic writing of this when group over here, that is, that is really uh, in heretic brothers. Uh, then there is this marvelous piece. Um, it is one of the latest pieces that we can date. Uh, we are lucky in this case because on the reverse of this piece there is a cartouche. And we can read it, it's the cartouche of uh, Ramesses XI. So even though this cartouche is later, I mean it's written over this uh, column of workman's marks, I still believe that this ostracon is quite late. I, I think the date in the time of, um, in the reign of Ramesses XI. Uh, it's very possible that it's. Um, Suggested by one of these identity marks, uh, which you see here. Um, it's a group again that we can really read. Uh, it, it, what it represents is this hieroglyphic group, and it can only refer to someone who we know uh, from the heretic documentation. We know him not very well, he's mentioned only once. It's a draftsman called uh, Paimi uh, Per Hedge. So his name is uh, the overseer of the treasury. That's his name. That is not a type, his title. Uh, we, we know that it's not his title because his title is draftsman. Uh, he's mentioned only once in a papyrus kept here in Turin. Uh, and so he is a very obscure uh, workman. We have hardly any information about him other than that he was a uh, draftsman. But his identity mark occurs on, well, let's say six or seven ostracons. So we can follow him through time and his position uh, uh, among these lists of workmen. So this is our latest piece. And again, look at the hand, this is a very neatly done piece. That is not to say that we still have other ostraca from this time, the, the late 20th dynasty, that uh, really display uh, a sloppy, uh, less experienced hand. They are still they are still there, many of them. Um, well, the, in the 20th dynasty, we are in a very favorable position because we have a lot of hieratic evidence and there are also numerous um, uh, ostraca with uh, identity marks that, that give us really a clue as to who is depicted. Uh, and now let's talk about um, one particular category of these ostraca with workman's marks from the 20th dynasty. In order to do that, uh, we need to discuss um, this system of deliveries that was going on at Tirumanina. So this is a uh, reconstruction of what the West Bank themes must have looked like, more or less, in the 20th dynasty. So we're looking at uh, uh, these fields with uh, many, uh, many of the mortuary temples. And then here, uh, here is the Medina and the village, the settlement, uh, sorry, here is the village, the kings and here. The um, now, these people worked for the government. They, they, they built, they constructed and decorated these tombs for, uh, for the king and they were uh, paid in commodities by uh, the government. So, these, these commodities, they um, consist of food, uh, uh, fish and bread and dates. It's, they're rations, basically. But also, this is a firewood. Uh, and they had to be brought to the village, because these people at their Medina, they are at work most of the time, uh, in the village of Kings, uh, most of the time. Uh, and 
and so there is an enormous isolated place, and there is a um, specific group of people consisting of woodcutters and fishermen and water carriers who are there specifically to deliver these goods to the village uh, of Dermody. So it, it is their job to uh, collect all these items and bring it to, uh, to Dermody. Now, uh, we know this system uh, quite well from the heretic documentation. There are numerous ostraca, mostly dating to the time of Ramesses III and Ramesses IV, that give lists and lists and lists of these uh, deliveries. They uh, record uh, usually one entire one, and there's a the date above it, and then it lists every day, um, and all the, the commodities that are delivered on a specific day. Now, not only that, uh, but they also mention who is bringing it, who of this group of, of, of deliverers, um, the Egyptian word for this group is the sender, the sender and lender. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, it mentions one of the workmen that is there probably uh, to receive these goods. We don't know exactly if this is uh, if this is what happened in, 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 in practice, but there is always one workman mentioned for one day. Um, and that's a different workman for each day, according to a system, a rotating system. So um, at the end of, the, of, this, of this order of workmen, so let's say uh, someone, someone's duty is on day one, then after 19 days, again, it's his turn to uh, receive these goods. Because in the time of Francis III, at the end of his reign, uh, this rotating system is 19 days long. There are 19 workmen who are in the system. Now, we know the system very well from Hamlet. What is interesting is that this is also recorded with marks on Ostraka. Um, and we have quite uh, uh, a lot of them. And they record the same uh, deliveries, and sometimes they really overlap. We can compare the heretic document for one particular month to uh, the Ostrakan written with marks for one particular month, and we see the same deliveries, more or less. That's really fascinating. Um, now, I can show you how these uh, things work more or less. Um, sometimes, in quite some cases, there is uh, a regional year mentioned. So, it's great. This we can read. This is uh, Rempet, Rempet, uh, the word for year, written in, well, let's call it cursive, hieroglyphic or heretic. Yeah, and heretic. And then a heretic numeral for 20. So, they use script. Then, um, here we find a sign or a combination of signs, and not entirely certain about the first sign. The second sign definitely is uh, an indication of the specific month of the year. The Egyptian year is 12 months, just as we do. And uh, they all have uh, a different name. Now, in hermetic practice, if you, if you want to write uh, a, a date uh, and you want to indicate the month, you do this by writing down uh, the season and then the number of the month. So let's say summer season, month number three. You do not write the name of the month. You have, there is a name for it, but in heretic practice you do not use it. But on these documents, we do not have the number of the month, but really a reference to the name, or rather perhaps the festival at the beginning of one of these months. So this uh, sign here is a ka sign that is used for the month. Ka uh, ka, and there's other other uh, designations for these ones that we find on these ostracks. Now, then it starts with listing all days of the month. Um, I give you an example here. So, such an entry begins with the hieroglyphic sign S, uh, an abbreviation for su, the Egyptian word for day. What then follows is an hieratic numeral, so again, they're, they're combining script uh, with what follows then, uh, the identity mark of the workman who is there to receive these goods. In this case, it is uh, Hori, and you see that his sign is a falcon, uh, a, a Hori, a falcon. Then there are a group of signs that are invented 
uh, to designate the commodities that are being delivered on that particular day. Uh, and it took some puzzling, but we have really solved in many of the, 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 the signs that they use. Um, well, here you are. This is a sign that is used for the left side of the crew. Uh, this sign below it is a sign for dates. Probably has something to do with the appearance of the date. Um, this sign is used for peasant bread, type of bread, uh, which is also used. Uh, this sign is also used to write uh, the, the word peasant. Then uh, this sign for beet bread. Well, you probably know the sign for for the sun, but it's it's a lag. And I think this is what that's what this sign represents. It's not very well done, but. It, it must be the lab. We have better examples where it really looks like a heretic bee. So an abbreviation, basically. And then uh, for, for beer, for, for, for a certain jar that contains beer, they draw a small jar, a small test jar. And all of these signs are combined with heretic numerals. And this is the way they record these deliveries. Now, because we have the heretic documentation on one hand and the uh, Marx Ostrakov on the other. And because they overlap, uh, we have been able to identify many of the identity marks because they record the same system. <coughs> and, um, well, with this knowledge, you can start puzzling. And it's from mostly from the information that we have from the 20th dynasty that we have been able to uh, decide for some of these other Ostrakov. And as we understood at some point that um, signs are passed on through uh, generations, you can work your way back from what we have uh, here in the 20th dynasty. So in some cases, the information from the 20th dynasty is really informative about uh, Ostrakhan from the 19th dynasty. Um, there is an example here in Turin that also records some of these uh, deliveries with this system. Um, I think it dates to uh, the beginning of the reign of Francis IV, yes. And there is a heretic parallel for it. So what is recorded on this ostracon is also recorded in heretic on an ostracon that is kept in the Ashmolean Museum, uh, Ashmolean 131. And we can compare it. Now, I, I told you that um, they overlap. That is true to some extent. There is, there's many instances where the heretic mentions something else um, as the, uh, the, the Marxist cartoon, and that is <laughs> frustrating. Uh, it's difficult to explain sometimes. Uh, so perhaps these, 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 these documents were written at different points in time, and perhaps uh, the Ostrakov and Marx were, were used to uh, make a more final draft in heretic. And, and that more information was added to it in the heretic final draft, that is still unclear. I'm still working on that. So if you look at some of these days, uh, days 10 to 13, you see that, well, there is not so much that matches uh, in terms of the deliveries that, that are, are recorded for these days. Um, but if we continue to the other side of the Ostracon, to days 21 and days 30, we have exact, almost exact matches. Uh, so on day 29, Marx Ostrakhan records the two deliveries of wood, one containing of 250 pieces and the other of 100 pieces. And that is exactly what is also recorded on this hermetic piece in the Ashmolean Museum. And uh, same goes for day 30, there is a delivery of 300 that is also mentioned in the hermetic piece. Then it also mentions a delivery of 290 pieces of wood that is not there in the other. So there are discrepancies. The same goes for um, some deliveries of uh, test jars. The marks uh, mention four jars, and in the heretic there are two. So I don't know what happened. Were the two disappear? This is unclear. Yeah. Um, <coughs> something also that is very interesting to point out, I think. Um, there are also signs that refer to these people of the Sendak personnel that make these deliveries, that bring these goods. Um, and here we have an example of the, the 
delivery of fish. This is the sign that is used for fish. And then we have these three signs that follow. Uh, they are hybrid signs. We can, we can read them. It's a ha, a ha, and then a. Now, uh, this sign, we know from other Ostrakan, refers to a fisherman who is called uh, Hart Nefer. So what happened here, they took the first, uh, the first uh, uh, letter of his name and abbreviated it, basically. Uh, and Ian Ha is another fisherman uh, that we know from this sign, uh, Ian Ha. I think he is mentioned in the, uh, in the entry that follows, and the E, I believe, refers to uh, the father of Ibn Ha, uh, who is called uh, Iman and Ibn. So, uh, again, one consonant hieroglyphs are used to abbreviate full names, and that is something that we also saw in, in some of these, these signs uh, for commodities. The B being used for beet bread, and the S being used for soup, day. So it's an interesting way to see uh, how these, these, these signs are, are well almost alphabetic in, in their use. Not all, of course. I mean, there is still this, the Ha sign that refers to uh, even Ha. And uh, there are other signs that, that are not one concern with marks, but it's an interesting development. Well, then something else I'd like to point out. Um, if we if we wonder uh, about who these these things, who 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 the scribe was that produced these ostraca, uh, we have some indications here and there that it was someone, if it is one person at all, who is not fully literate. Um, there are instances of of mistakes of uh, writing mistakes. Um, this sign over here is a heretic numeral, well, it needs to be a heretic numeral, uh, for 20. Uh, what the scribe has made of it is this sign, but what it needs to be is this sign. So he has inverted it again. This is something that an heretic, a fully trained heretic scribe would never do. Um, so that is a, this is an indication again that this, the person that made this particular ostracon was probably not well trained in heretic. But there are other pieces um, from the 20th dynasty in which these marks are used. Again, uh, there are two beautiful pieces um, uh, from the Turin Museum. One of them actually is just around the corner, it's, it's on display. Um, it's the, this one, yes. Uh, so what we have here uh, are depictions of um, pieces of furniture, uh, chests and chairs and, and other things. And, Next to these pieces of furniture, workman's marks are found. Um, some of them, at least. This one, for example, uh, and this one, and this one. They refer to workmen. Probably this, this ship also. I'm not so certain about, about this sign here and this sign here. That could be an indication of the quality of uh, the furniture as has been um, uh, uh, proposed by, by some other scholars. Um, but this is another way of, of, of making such documents, and, and these documents don't really refer to uh, the official work on the tomb. There are not lists of workmen's marks, uh, um, you know, as are hieratic lists um, used for the documentation of the work on the tomb. We know from hieratic sources that um, the workmen also uh, were busy in the production of pieces of furniture, um, funerary objects that they sold to uh, uh, high officials in Thebes. Uh, we know that from, from, we know this from heretic sources, so what we have here is perhaps um, evidence of the same thing, that groups of, of uh, workmen are come together to produce such uh, objects, such, such, such furniture um, pieces, and have been documented, they have been documenting their uh, their activities on such ostraca. So that's just something, another development. Well, um, I've more or less come to the end of my talk. What we have seen, I think, is that um, these identity marks 
have a long tradition in, in, in Dir Medina and you see the development of the use of these marks <clears throat> from being simply markers of property and, 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 and signs used uh, to, to, to produce lists of workmen to uh, documents in which um, the, uh, the distribution of goods and uh, the delivery of goods are being brought to, well, private documentation. Um, and it's, 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 it's a, well, I think an interesting insight in, into the lives of these people. Um, some things that you do not find in the official uh, heretic uh, documentary practice. Uh, we finally hear something from those people who do not write. And I think that's, uh, that's something worth looking at. So, thank you very much. <laughs>
So uh, what was the last estimate? I think we're, well, around 200, 300, something like that. Okay, and, and, and that's even that question is um, if, our, if our identity marks could be inherited, uh, maybe inferred that what it was, uh, there was a, 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 how to say, um, it was used in a, in a way, uh, so in a more than an administrative way, so it was a sort of cultural meaning, so mm -hmm. tradition, tradition, spirits with. Yes, uh, yes, that I think is the case uh, to some extent. Of course, we don't know. Um, that's the problem uh, when we talk about the 18th dynasty, when these marks first appear. We hardly know uh, anything about these people. Where they might have come from is, is uncertain. Um, but it's clear that in the 18th dynasty, marks are used on other sides. So this might be a longer tradition. and. Because such marks are used particularly in sites of construction and sites of uh, uh, quarries, these people are in, uh, at Dir Medina are essentially doing the same thing. They're constructing a space and they're cutting out stones. So perhaps this is a tradition that is found uh, yeah, among people who, are, who work in such uh, sectors. Um, on the other hand, yeah, it's hard to prove because uh, you have no data about other, uh, other parts of society so much. Uh, but yes, it could be. And Dir Medina certainly becomes sort of a tradition. Um, and definitely for the 19th and 20th dynasty, you can see that there is a consistency in the use of these marks. It's still not so clear if we can uh, continue the line from the 18th dynasty right to the 19th dynasty, because we know a reorganization took place in the 19th dynasty, at the beginning of the 19th dynasty, or actually the end of the 18th dynasty, under Horem Heb. Um, it's, it's still, we, we kind of see a break. So the uh, repertoire of Marx of the 18th dynasty is quite different to that of the 19th dynasty. But the phenomenon is still there, and it's used in basically the same way. So, there is a Dir Medina tradition of using these marks, whether it extends further back. Yeah, it's difficult to say. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Well, and I thank you again for this wonderful insight you gave us, making us realize how little we know, as usual, but that's something <laughs> we learn every day in studying Egyptology. So thank you again. And uh, invece vi aspetto tutti i lunedì abbiamo un'altra um, conferenza, parleremo di una cosa completamente diversa che è la gestione dei beni culturali e data la grande affluenza che abbiamo ricevuto la conferenza non sarà qui ma sarà nella sala del Mappamondi eh, alla Piena delle Scienze alle 19, quindi a lunedì, grazie. Yeah. 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 Yeah.